What you do not smell is called iocane powder. It is odorless, tasteless, dissolves instantly in liquid, and is among the more deadly poisons known to man. The Princess Bride. You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome to Writing Roots, I'm Lee Hole. And I'm Lee Esses. For the record, most poisons don't actually kill you quickly, and the poisons that we are going to talk about today, you really can't build immunity toward. We are talking about heavy metal poisoning, and the fact that you can't build an immunity toward it, really, is one of the things that makes it among the historical favorites of ways to kill people, because the more you accumulate, the more dangerous it is. And so you can slowly poison someone over time as compared to something like stabbing them or something else to off them. The main three that we're going to be talking about today are cyanide, arsenic, and mercury poisoning, just because these are three of the most popular and you'll start to see a theme of all three of these are going to have very similar symptoms, very similar flavors, very similar experiences. When you're trying to write poisonings, the experience of poisoning, we, we don't encourage you to test it out, <laughs> but other people have. So we have the information available for us to be able to write it. One of the first experiences most people will consider will be the taste. Iocane powder, it's odorless and tasteless. Most poisons are not in this category. Cyanide is going to taste bitter, kind of like bitter almonds. It's heavily theorized that iocane powder was based off of arsenic. It doesn't kill you quickly, and there's no Dread Pirate Roberts building that immunity, but it has very little to no actual flavor. It's often seen as bitter because of the other things it's combined with. And then mercury is difficult to taste in its pure form, but it is a metal, and it's said to have a kind of metallic aftertaste. Something that really needs to be thought through before your characters use poison is the dosage, because the amount of dosage will affect how quickly the characters die and what kind of symptoms they have, how quickly they arise. The more dose that you give someone at the very beginning, the more suspicious it is. So it was very common to just start slipping a little bit into the tea or whatever and make it so that it looks like they were dying of natural causes. This could be something done over the course of weeks or months to make the person sick for a while before they finally died. So they'd want to make it look like a different illness that was difficult to cure or the cure wasn't working or whatever. Those heavy metals are a good way to do that in very small doses. And you will hear us likely say a couple of times in this episode and the next that the dose makes the poison. This applies to almost anything. The dose makes the poison. When we're talking about heavy metal poisoning actually occurring in like realistically and every day, not just in the fantastic stories that we weave, most of the time they're actually inhaled and it's accidental. If you are poisoning someone on purpose, it's often ingested because you don't want to also experience the poisoning. But in the case of like metalworking or coal mining, these other types of operations where these heavy metals are used in the smelting process, they are often breathed in more than eaten. It can also be gotten accidentally through eating not necessarily an in intentional poisoning. If you look at something like mercury levels in fish, it's the ingestion of critters from other things higher in the food chain. So what actually happens to the body when you ingest a heavy metal? The first thing that we're going to talk about is the kidney and heart failure. All of those organs that are trying to do their jobs, metals make it hard to do the job. For something like cyanide, it will prevent the cells from being able to collect oxygen, which is very important for survival. All of your organs, all of you needs oxygen, and when your cells can't collect that, you die. 
with arsenic. It was very popular because it was mixed with cholera and malaria and some other common illnesses because a lot of the symptoms overlap. Something like you're dying of dehydration because your body is expelling number two a lot faster than you can keep up with because your body's trying to purge this metal and it's sending everything out and you end up killing yourself via dehydration. And in a similar vein, mercury will cause something like muscle weakness. There will be numbness, loss of motor control. There's also a lot of effects on the mental capacity when it comes to mercury. Theorized that the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland was based on actual hatters who would go a little mad because of the amount of mercury that they were working with. Part of that muscle weakness and the loss of motor control happened on the inside as well as the outside, so it would become harder and harder to do things like breathe and digest and these other things that are necessary for existing. The last one that a lot of these have, especially mercury, are seizures. So your body will try to deal with and fight with these heavy metals by having seizures, and it obviously doesn't help. And it can often screw with the brain and be one of the more fatal things about these metals. Now let's talk about the kind of person who would poison someone else, who would use a poison, particularly a heavy metal poison, to kill. It is often associated that women are more likely to poison people than others. I don't know how actually true that is, but it is a common thing thrown around. A lot of that is because it does the job well without having to deal with physical discrepancies. So you would consider a lot of women would poison their abusive husbands and do it over the course of a couple weeks because, oh no, they're just getting sick but it would be in a way that their husband wouldn't be able to fight back. One of the things that I noticed, historically speaking, is if it's not self-induced, a heavy metal will be given as a poison to someone who is about an equal standing socially. It might just be because we have more records of the wealthier classes, the upper classes, but most of the historical poisonings happened with the elites, not the everyday, because these metals are difficult to get a hold of. One of these cases would be something like the Medici, the family that the Lannisters were based off of, if you are familiar with the Game of Thrones series. They were very big on poisoning each other, especially. As the family grew and grew more wealthy, they would try to off each other in order to keep the inheritance line as narrow as possible. Like the Medici's poison in general, these heavy metals have a very strong place in a lot of our historical records, a lot of our knowledge. Arsenic especially was a huge thing in Victorian era where you have the famous Paris green color that was being used in clothes, in books, on wallpapers, that was based completely on arsenic. It was used in beauty products, and it was believed that it helped people become more beautiful, because if you look at the historical context of that era, for some reason, people really thought the tuberculosis look was in. That was the height of fashion and beauty. So they wanted to look pale and sickly, and these arsenic products really helped with that. <laughs> I wonder why. Cyanide? I feel like we all kind of know where this is going historically. <laughs> it was used a lot in World War I in a gaseous form to kill a lot of people. World War I was a really terrible time for gaseous type killings during the war. You had mustard gas, cyanide-based stuff, and all that. In World War II, cyanide was actually put into pill form, and this is where we most often imagine cyanide being used nowadays, is self-induced. They would give these pills, they were called L pills for lethal, and they would give them to spies and often pilots who could find themselves stuck behind enemy lines, and rather than be tortured to death or have some terrible way to go, they had this option to off themselves quickly in order to avoid something worse. You just had to hope it actually worked. Yeah, there was that. 
<laughs> this practice did not end with the war. It continued and persisted generally throughout the Cold War. And for historical context on Mercury, this was used a lot in dyes and colorings. It was used a lot for hat dyes. Again, the phrase mad as a hatter likely reference to mercury poisoning. But if you look at something like cinnabar, makes a beautiful shade of red paint and then kills the painter. Cinnabar being used and killing people goes to prehistorical times. Some of the earliest cave drawings that you see are made with cinnabar. Pliny the Elder actually advised people who were painting or doing other things with cinnabar to like wear facial protection. <laughs> and some of the earliest PPE was because mercury is found in cinnabar. There was also a Chinese emperor who died in 210 BC because he ingested mercury pills that were believed to give him eternal life. Kind of did the opposite. So there's a lot of history, a lot of interesting things. And of course, arsenic, cyanide, mercury, these are not the only heavy metals that can be used in poisonings. There's a lot that you can choose, different things you can do. Next episode, we're going to be talking about other forms of poisonings, such as venoms, plants, etc. But any kind of poison can be a very effective way to go about writing deaths in your book, depending on, again, the psychology and personality of the killer. Would they be the kind of person to kill someone with poison? If they are, write selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 